Hello everyone and welcome back to Math 110, Introduction to Number Theory. And in this video what we're going to talk about are what are the integers and the rationals? What are z and q? Last time we took an in-depth look into the natural numbers, descending down into the strata of mathematics to close to the foundations. And so while we're at it in this video, we're going to say a bit about how we can also define the integers and the rationals. Since this is a number theory course, it'd be nice to know what numbers are, right? Uh, so in this video, we'll give definitions for the integers and rationals. We'll see how the way that they're defined, they provide missing operations that the natural numbers do not provide. And we'll clarify the relationship between the natural numbers, the integers, and the rationals. Uh, because we commonly think of the naturals as being a subset of the integers, which are a subset of the rationals, but that's more of a convention, if you will. Um, so the goals I get for having this video are that you get a sense of what these familiar number systems are, and I'm putting that in quotes because I'm just giving an implementation of these number systems. Um, they're actually a lot of ways that you could do them. They all have the same properties in the end, and that's all that's really important. Um, and then another goal is that you gain more intuition for what constitutes formal reasoning, um, where a caveat is that our logical foundations are still naive. Naive meaning that everything's not completely formal, but hopefully what we're doing is intuitively rigorous. So what is it that the natural numbers are missing? One thing that they're missing is that while we can add with natural numbers, we can't always unadd. So for example, we can, uh, if we have three plus n equals five, this has a solution, um, and that solution is the unaddition, uh, if you will, of uh, five by three. And in this case, that's two. Uh, however, other similar equations do not have solutions, like 3 plus n equals 2. And while you might be thinking, well, it's minus 1, well, of course, minus 1 is not a natural number. Um, and I am writing this as unadd instead of subtract because we didn't define subtraction, and the natural numbers don't even have the subtraction operation. Um, Though there are some variants of subtraction, like truncated subtraction, but, uh, well, we don't need that, so we won't talk about it. Another operation that we have is multiplication, but we can't always unmultiply. Um, and again, unmultiply instead of divide because we don't have division defined. So, for example, um, 3n equals 6 has a solution, n equals 2 but 3n equals 7 does not. What we will do now is examine this failure to have an addition for the natural numbers and try to add it in a formal way. Uh, I guess you can be thinking about this in terms of how the complex numbers are from formally adding square roots of negative numbers. So given a and b and the natural numbers, let's write this symbol here. This is a formal expression, b minus a in brackets. I just made this notation up for this lecture. And all it is is a fancy way of writing down two numbers as a ordered pair. So one thing to remember is that the word formal means pertaining to form or arrangement. Form is even in the word. And what I mean by formal expression is that it's just this notation that has a particular form and in it we can see the elements that we are interested in. Okay, so this uh, formal expression is meant to represent solutions to the uh, equation a plus n equals b. And uh, so to get some sort of diagrammatic idea for what I mean by this. So for example, uh, three or if a is three and uh, b is five, then this formal expression five minus three 
sort of represents this difference going from three to five. In particular, it should be two. But for the uh, one from before, which was three plus n equals two, this one is this new sort of uh, difference, which goes in sort of the wrong direction from three to two. Um, okay. So um, with these formal expressions, we can come up with these formal arithmetic operations. And it's just some sort of way to manipulate them that will later on be used to define these operations for the integers. But for now, they're just sort of formal things for manipulating these arrows. So one thing that's interesting is that if you have um, the equation, uh, if you have a solution to a plus n equals b and a solution to c plus m equals d, then you can get a solution to a different equation from uh, at adding the two equations together. So we have a plus c plus n plus m pl equals b plus d. And so n plus m is a solution to this equation involving a plus c and b plus d. So um, if n is representing b, this b minus a expression, and m is representing this d minus c expression, then this expression, b plus d minus a plus c, it represents n plus m. And again, this isn't actually a minus sign yet. It's just this thing holding b plus d and a minus c as a pair. Another thing we can do is try to define a negation operation on these expressions. So if we take a plus n equals b and just imagine that we had subtracted n from both sides, then we get another equation, which is that this minus n ought to be solving b plus something equals a. And so from this, since n is um, this b minus a expression, then minus n should be this other expression, a minus b, because it's the same form for this particular kind of equation. Um, and may as well mention subtraction. So when you have addition and negation, you don't need a special subtraction operation because you can define it to be adding the negative. And so I wrote that out there. Okay, there's a problem with formal expressions of this type, and that is that there are too many of them in a certain sense. So uh, as an example, let's consider three plus n equals five and four plus n equals six. Both of these equations have the same solution n equals two. So uh, the first equation's expression is that two is five minus three, and the second equation gives that two is six minus four. So we need to have some way to be able to say that five minus three is the same as six minus four, where right now they're just these symbolic expressions. So how can we resolve this? So one part of this is to come up with some sort of way to know when two of these expressions are meant to be the same. So let's analyze a bit of this. Let's suppose that n is a solution to two equations, just like in the example, but with symbols now, or variables. So a plus n equals b and a prime plus n equals b prime. Um, so we have these because we want to now relate a, b, a prime, and b prime in some way. So without loss of generality, we, because we can swap the two equations, let's just assume a is less than or equal to a prime. So from before, uh, in the previous video, we saw that the definition of a is less than or equal to a prime is that there is a k such that a prime is a plus k. So if we then take the second equation here and uh, substitute in this uh, a plus k into it, then we get that b prime is a plus k plus n and then commuting these, and then using that um, a plus n is b, we get that b prime is b plus k. 
So now let's take stock in what just happened here. Um, so on one hand, we have that B prime minus A prime, that expression just actually is equal to B plus K minus A plus K because, um, well, that's what A prime and B prime are. But um, we are, a, because these N is a solution to both of them, then we want these to be equivalent. So th this is suggesting that we have a rule, which is that whenever we have an expression, then we should be able to add the same amount to both sides. Um, so this rule geometrically is that if you have a difference, you should be able to shift it back and forth. They're like vectors, and it's essentially the same sort of idea. That last definition was all well and good, but it's nice when you have fewer variables involved. So let's look at uh, a more elegant formulation of that equivalence. So if we take a plus n equals b, which was the first equation, and we take the second equation but flipped over, then if we uh, add the two equations together, we get that a plus b prime plus n is a prime plus b plus n. And so there's an n on both sides. And so we have that a plus b prime is equal to a prime plus b. So that is another way of stating the equation that we looked at before, but where you don't actually need to talk about some sort of k. And we, don't, we also don't need a to be bigger than or smaller than a prime, which is nice. So let us use this to actually define the equivalence. So we say that b minus a, the symbol is equivalent to b prime minus a prime if uh, this sort of cross addition uh, happens, or it is equal. So we add those and we want it to equal those. So I'm calling this an equivalence, but right now it's really just a binary relation, though you can prove that it is an equivalence relation if you know what those are. And we'll talk more about equivalence relations in a future lecture. Um, but knowing what they are isn't essential right now. Okay, so now that we have defined this equivalence relation, we define Z to be the set of all formal differences, or all these formal expressions, modulo this relation. So the process of taking a set modulo relation is known as creating a quotient set and it's a way to uh, take things that are equivalent and make them equal. It creates this new set um, with like one element for every equivalence class. And that's the way that we collapse all of that uh, extraneous stuff that was in there down into what was essential. Um, so we won't go into what a quotient set is exactly right now, but I will tell you what properties it has. Um, and these are enough to at least work with them in all respects. So um, th this is what characterizes a quotient set. The first thing is that there's a function known as the canonical projection or a quotient map, which in our case takes these formal uh, difference uh, expressions and then converts them into being an element of z, which is what, we're def uh, what is defined here. Uh, we don't really care what elements of z actually look like. Um, when in the previous video we were looking at natural numbers, we were saying that they were these like successor and zero expressions. But here we're just going to manipulate them using um, this q function. Okay, so a second uh, a part of the characterization is that this Q is surjective, which remember means that every z element of Z is the image of some uh, s element of the set. Uh, and so the first two together are what make it so that Q is enough to be able to at least describe every element of Z, even if we don't actually know what the elements of Z like actually look like beyond that. 
Okay, and then the third property is very important. It's the one that says that the equivalence from before is being turned into equalities. Um, and by the way, just for a notational convenience for me, I'm dropping the parentheses for the function application. Uh, I just thought it didn't look very nice and it was a lot of parentheses. So Q next to something means Q of that thing. Okay, so for three, the uh, property is that for all quadruples of natural numbers, if the formal uh, expressions are equivalent according to the equivalence from the previous slide, then the images in Z are equal. And also conversely, if two of these symbols have equal images, then they are equivalent. So equivalence is equivalent to equality. Um, okay, so it's a theorem of set theory that quotient sets actually exist. They're not that hard to construct. I just don't want to go into some uh, set theory right now and go too far afield. Uh, and also, um, three going in the leftward direction, that equality implies equivalence. It does depend on it, it being an equivalence relation, and we did not show this, but um, it's not too hard to show that it is an equivalence relation. So, okay, so these are our three properties. Let's prove a theorem. Um, this is one of the only theorems today in this video. So if we have an integer, then there is a natural number such that n is either the image of a minus 0 or the image of 0 minus a. So in other words, we're showing that every integer can be thought of as being non-negative or non-positive. Um, so in, in particular, we're showing that basically most of the formal differences in the set are just un, uh, unnecessary. We only need the ones where one of the two is zero. Um, and then, yeah, so then that means that we are left with just a number line for the integers using only these symbols. Okay, so let's prove it. Um, so by property two, so we're, okay, assume that n is some integer. Then by property two, since q is surjective, then that means that there exists some a and b such that n is actually equal to uh, some image, the image of b minus a. Okay, so let's look at two cases. Case one is that b is greater than or equal to a, and in which case uh, b is k plus a for some uh, k. And then the claim is that uh, b minus a, that symbol, is equivalent to k minus zero. And so let's look at what the equivalence was that we were using and that is that these cross sums are equal. So let's see, cross sum, cross sum. So b plus zero equals a plus k, that's this. And then um, this is true it's because that was uh, our assumption about b being greater than or equal to a. And so then by three, because we showed that these two things were equivalent, then we know that their images are equal through q. And so n being q b minus a is equal to q k minus zero. Okay, so that's case one. Case two is just um, with this flipped. And these are not mutually exclusive cases. It doesn't really matter if cases are mutually exclusive, just that they are comprehensive. Okay, so um, this means that there's some k, again, with uh, this time a being b plus k, and through a similar process, we can see that um, b minus a is equivalent to zero minus k, and so n is equal to q of zero minus k by property three. Okay, so we've comprehensively handled all cases, we showed in both of them that the conclusion holds 
for one of them where this was the uh, non-negative case and that's the non-positive case. And so we're done. Now that we've characterized what the elements of Z are, which are these now that we've characterized what the elements of Z are as either non-positive or non-negative integers, which of course meet at zero in the middle, it's worth considering in what sense the natural numbers are integers. So just to first approximation, they're just not because natural numbers are these S and zero expressions, but the integers are this quotient construction. So they might not overlap at all, but um, it's very convenient to at least pretend that the natural numbers are in the integers. And there are in fact uh, ways using some set theories so that it actually does end up lying inside the integers. But uh, one thing we can do is when we have a natural number, we can, when we write it as an integer, we can imagine that we are instead having it stand for taking the quotient of n minus zero. Um, one thing that justifies this is that there's this, this is actually defining a function. So for every natural number, we can get an integer by taking n and mapping it to n minus zero's image through the canonical map. And one can prove that it's injective. We're not doing that here. Um, and because it's injective, then that means that the image of n um, is an identical copy, at least as a set. Um, and so uh, one thing that's important though is that n has its own arithmetic operations and we need to make sure that it matches up with whatever arithmetic operations we define for z. Otherwise, this is a little of a pointless sort of embedding. Um, another sort of strategy so that you don't have to pretend is that you take that image and just treat it as being the natural numbers and forget the original definition and use those from now on. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just mentioning these foundational things. Okay, so some arithmetic operations. Um, how do we define them? So thinking back a few slides ago, we defined some formal operations between these formal expressions. And so the idea is that we apply Q to both sides of them, and then that just gives us what the uh, operations ought to be for the integers. Um, okay, so given two integers, then by property th uh, two, they can both be represented as being images of some of these differences. And then, um, well, let's define three operations. So n plus m is we take the image of b plus d minus a plus c. Uh, negative n, we swap the a and b. And uh, I didn't calculate this for you, but n times m, we can do this sort of cross multiplication. Um, what this comes from, well, you can calculate it in the other ways by manipulating these different equalities. But for here, if we pretend that subtraction is a legitimate subtraction, then it's from expanding out this, just FOIL. So BD um, minus BC um, minus AD plus AC. And so we collect the positive terms for the first part and then the negative terms for the second part. An important thing here that we are not showing is that this does not depend on the choices for A, B, C, and D. Or in other words, it's a well-defined operation, which is the key phrase whenever people are manipulating quotients or quotient sets. Um, but indeed they are. Uh, it's just, it's tedious to do. So, uh, and we've done enough induction proofs uh, this week. And so more proofs would, that we could do are commutativity, associativity, distributivity, and so on and so forth. And they, you can show that they all do work. And also you can show that 
uh, you can add natural numbers and then see what it is as an integer, or you can see what the natural numbers are as integers and add those and they match up. So there's all these compatibility relations um, and it all works and that's great. So, and we won't do that here. Okay, so now that we have some idea of the integers uh, as being this thing where we added all of these um, like uh, unadditions or subtractions, which um, just to summarize it uh, more clearly, a plus n equals b, where a and b are integers, now has a unique solution, uh, which is just b minus a. We now have subtraction, where um, I should say b minus a equals b plus negative a, just to be complete there. But we can't always unmultiply with the integers. And that's where the rationals will come in. So we do the same sort of game. We look at equations. This time, instead of addition, it's a n equals b that we want to unmultiply. And also, we want a to be non-zero because zero n equals like three just shouldn't have a solution. Okay, so we again have formal expressions. This time, b over a in brackets. And we can calculate some formal operations for multiplication and addition. For multiplication, um, so if we have b over a and uh, d over c, so this would be, I'm going to have this symbol represent n and this one represent m. If we multiply the corresponding equations together, then we get ac nm equals bd. And so nm, this product, ought to be BD over AC. Okay, so that is the formal multiplication. And then there is also addition, which is a little bit more complicated to get, but it's, it's, uh, it's getting common, denominator, common denominators essentially. So if we have our first equation, we multiply it by C, our second equation, multiply it by A. And now when we add the two equations together, uh, we can factor out the AC and get an N plus M in there that is solving another equation. So we've got, again, N and M, and this will be N plus M. So N plus M is solving that when you multiply it by AC, you get AD plus BC. And so that is the formal expression that I wrote on the right side there. Okay, like before, um, there are too many expressions, and we need to have some way to tell when two of them are supposed to be the same. Um, so let's say that n is some integer that solves a n equals b and c n equals d to motivate what the um, what the procedure should be. So we take the equation a n equals b and for the first, uh, you know, for the first equation, and then we take the second equation reversed and multiply them, and we get ADN equals BCN. So this put an N on both sides. And whether or not N is zero, um, it does end up being that AD equals BC. So if N is not zero, then there's a cancellation law we can use to cancel it from both sides. But if N is zero, then uh, from the first equation, b is zero, and from the second equation, d is zero. So both sides are zero anyway, so that is true. So this suggests that, um, okay, so since b over a is representing the solution to the first equation and d over c is representing the second equation and they're both supposed to be the same, then um, these expressions should be equivalent if um, the uh, relationship that we just derived holds, which in particular is the good old cross multiplication. So let's take that as what we want to use. Um, so like before, we can create the quotient set where we take all these formal fractions 
where a and b are integers where the denominator is non-zero. But then we're making it so that two of these fractions that are equivalent are now equal in this set q. Okay, so for some notational convenience, let's write b over a without brackets to be the image of bracketed b over a. So b over a is the rational associated to b, over b and a. Um, okay, so before where we were thinking about the natural numbers as being integers, we can think of the integers as being rational numbers too. And, one, and the way to do that is for each integer, we can have it um, be identified with n over one. So the integers aren't literally a subset of Q, but we can at least pretend they are, or we can take all the n over ones for all n, um, and then think of that as just being the integers from now on, if we wanted. Okay, um, like before, we can define arithmetic operations using those formal operations that we uh, derived. So to add fractions as elements of Q, we can find common denominators like before and just make this be the definition. Um, and for multiplying fractions, again, we use the formal operation as the definition. And negation, we didn't talk about that one, but it comes into the numerator. And then lastly, there is just like uh, negation for the integers was this um, reversing operation. For the rationals, we have this other operation which flips the fraction, and that is the multiplicative inverse. And it's only, and unlike the integers, there's this condition that it only actually is an operation that exists when the fraction is non-zero. One thing that we're not checking here is that this does not depend on the choices of A, B, C, or D. That takes uh, some tedious work, um, but it is true. And again, we can prove that all these operations are commutative, associative, that there's distributivity, and so on and so forth. So starting with the natural numbers, we saw how we could construct the integers and the rationals. And we saw how the integers comes from formally admitting solutions to subtraction problems that have no solutions. And we get negative numbers out of that. And the rationals come from doing the same, but for division problems. Um, and we get fractional numbers out of that. Something that we won't talk about in this class uh, are some further number systems that you can get from admitting uh, additional things that did not exist. So the real numbers, they come from formally admitting these uh, limits of, of sequences that seem to converge. They're Cauchy sequences. That's one way to define the real numbers. And um, so for example, the square root of two, this is a number that you can define well, it, you can define what the square root of 2 ought to be as a, se as a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers, but that sequence does not converge as a rational number. And so um, the square root of 2 is a new number that only the reals have and the rationals do not. Complex numbers, they also come from admitting new things, and in this case it's roots of polynomials, and it turns out all you have to do is add the root of x squared plus 1 equals 0. That's, a, that's something that has no solutions using uh, x as a real number. And then every other polynomial has a root from then on. So starting in a few videos, we're going to see modular arithmetic, which is a different number system which is some sort of shadow of different properties of the integers. And one thing that is interesting is it kind of goes off in a different direction from this hierarchy of the naturals, integers, rationals, reals, and complex numbers. Uh, and so I guess you might be used to thinking that like the longer you do math, the more you learn about the uh, like higher things in this hierarchy, but at some point, it turns out that it's just this is a nice one, but there are lots of other places that you can explore.
and we are going to explore in another direction. Well, thanks for coming along with me on this little adventure to see some of the details on what goes into defining the integers and the rationals, and I'll see you next time.